Uh, yo, what's up? Um, my name is Jack. I'm going to talk about the unsolved problem of Bitcoin derivatives. Um, but firstly, I'm super humbled to be here. This is unbelievable. A lot of the people I look up to in this space are, are in the audience. So thank you all for having me. Um, but yeah, I'm Jack. I do this like zap thing um, that people use sometimes. Um, but what's not really well known, I also am the founder of uh, the CBE group. Uh, it stands for the Chicago Bitcoin Exchange Group um, with the goal of offering professional risk transfer on this new asset class. Um, so I'm going to get my finance bro on real quick and ditch the lightning stuff for 15 minutes. Uh, and we're going to get deep into derivatives. Um, so this is a cool picture, actually. Uh, that's my grandfather on the left who ran the Chicago Board of Trade and my uncle in the middle and my dad on the right on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. And uh, this is my dad and I holding a 1977 futures opening call that uh, was operated by my grandfather. Uh, so we've got some deep history. And I remember calling my parents, calling my dad, and like, yo, dad, you did this on a different commodity. Um, let's figure out what's really going on in uh, the Bitcoin space, in the exchange space, in the market, in derivatives. Uh, and let's get to the bottom of this. Um, so by show of hands, uh, how many people know what a derivative contract even is? Yeah? All right, a bunch of BitMEX traders. Um, cool, great. Yeah, so a derivative uh, is a contract, um, sometimes even a security, so a separate asset um, that is based on an underlying. Now, that underlying can be a physical asset. Uh, it can be an index. Um, but it is a separate asset that is settles against an underlying value. And uh, in Bitcoin, we have derivatives, right? We have, <laughs> this is our derivatives. Um, BitMEX, uh, wrecked all the plebs. This is, this is our derivative space uh, in crypto. Um, so Bitcoin derivatives market, I'm overgeneralizing a little bit here because we obviously have the CME product, we have some spot futures. Um, but the Bitcoin derivatives market is more or less the, this perpetual swap, right? Um, that is what garners all of the volume. Um, but the perpetual swap is actually um, really a spot trading product. Um, the way that it's constructed and through its funding rates, it's actually supposed to be traded like a typical spot product, like a BTC USD product. Um, its innovation is that uh, you can speculate on BTC USD with no bank account, right? It's almost a regulatory arbitrage on needing a bank account, needing KYC AML. And it allows leverage speculation on Bitcoin with no bank account. The friction of entry is really low, and it's garnered this retail flow. Um, but in the sense of traditional derivatives, it's not really a derivative. It's kind of a derivative. By definition, it's a derivative, but it's more or less like a Bitcoin spot product on steroids. Um, even in their specification, um, the rate is referring to their funding rate. The funding rate is aimed to actually make sure that the contract cannot get too out of a whack with the underlying index of the spot. So it's actually intentionally supposed to be traded like a spot product. Um, most derivatives traditionally, now we're talking in historical markets, are used to transfer risk. That's their initial value proposition, is to transfer risk. So let's go into that a little bit. If we go to uh, this picture of my grandpa, my, my daddy, uh, and what they were doing, uh, they were building derivatives for this guy. This is a corn farmer. Now, the corn farmer is extremely important in the corn market, obviously. <laughs> um, but he's not a speculator, and he doesn't make markets, right? What's his role? Um, so the corn farmer has this inherent by default position on corn. The corn farmer is inherently long corn, right? The corn farmer is farming the corn with the expectation that he can sell it at a higher price. Um, but what if there's like bad weather? God forbid the corn farmer farms in Chicago where I live. <laughs> it's like snowing in May. Um, or if corn prices go down, like I've seen more irrational things like the existence of Ripple or something, right? Like, <laughs> things happen, markets happen, you know? Um, and so corn farmers are inherently long corn, so they short corn futures. And this idea right here is what we call a hedge. This is why derivatives were invented. Um, so if we walk through this, here's my little corn farmer man on the left, and he's expecting to get 100 bushels of corn selling at a, a buck each, $1 a pop. 
And so he puts on a short and he's selling corn futures at a dollar. And this right here is a hedge. Now if corn goes up, those bushels get a green check mark next to it. Those are more valuable, but his short now loses value, right? So he's essentially crossed himself out of any risk that the market can put on him and he can focus on making corn. That's what his job. Um, and in the vice versa, if corn crashes, his bushels aren't worth a lot, but his short hedge actually nailed it. He, he put on a short, the price went down, and he's getting paid out. So this is what we call a hedge. Most derivatives are used to hedge risk. Um, so who are Bitcoin's corn farmers? It's probably an obvious one. Miners, who said that? Cheater. The Bitcoin miners, right? Do we have risk transfer products in this industry? How are derivatives used in this industry and are they used effectively and efficiently? Um, so back to this picture of me. So I have a personal Bitcoin position, right? I'm long Bitcoin, but for the sake of this talk, I'm shorting the dollar against Bitcoin when I buy Bitcoin, right? Um, what is this guy's position? What is this Bitcoin miner's position? It's really complicated. So the Bitcoin miner has a long bias on the asset like I do. Over a longer time frame, the miner is hoping that the value of Bitcoin goes up against their de denominated fiat, right? Ready? Brain cell tinkle time. They're also inherently short difficulty. By a show of hands, does everyone know what difficulty is? Yep. So I put it in here anyway, just in case. Safe valve. Uh, difficulty, obviously, is the measure uh, to find a hash below a given target. And in Bitcoin, it adjusts every 2016 blocks to officially make a predictable issuance rate, right? So that you can never have any hyperinflation. Um, and so the miners have this in inherent short difficulty, right? Because if difficulty goes up, they're not going to get as many bushels of corn. They're not going to get as many bitcoins. Um, do you see this black line here? Can you imagine being inherently short that? Whoops. <laughs> That's a tough trade, right? That's a really complicated trade. And then to add on to it, they also have this call option on hardware. Because hardware has an expiry to it. And the premium that they pay on hardware is the sim similarity to the premium you pay on a call option. And there's a decay aspect that as time goes on, your hardware gets less and less valuable. And you also add this brown line at the bottom of the cost of hash rate. And, and if we revisit this slide, like, my goodness, this is a complicated trade. Why don't you guys just <laughs> short the dollar against Bitcoin? Holy cow, you got to be kidding me. This is complex, right? If I'm doing this right, Everyone in here would be like, wow, like that's wild. Um, and the other thing is like, we can't typically, one of my friends texts me like, hey Jack, um, the thing is down that you told me to buy. I'm like, yeah, but bro, just hodl. <laughs> just hodl, bear market, hodl. Miners can't hodl this position. This is serious defined risk. Their risk is not speculative risk. Their risk is baked into the economics of Bitcoin, right? Um, so what I made over the last six months is a, a, an array of Bitcoin difficulty products and other mining products um, that settle in block time um, and are derivatives and structured notes that are designed towards miners and garnering a risk transfer market within this asset class. I think that the exchange space and the market space here is relatively immature and that uh, over the next decade, I expect our market to really mature a lot, attract some more advanced market participants. And so I kind of wanted to kickstart that can down the road. It's funny, actually, settling in block time, I'm sitting with a bunch of uh, NYSE, ISE, old capital market folks, and we get on the phone, and one of them goes, okay, so we're doing this mining Bitcoin difficulty thing, and the guy goes, no, I know mining Bitcoin sounds difficult. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's actually a math problem. Um, and then uh, they go, what's block time? Like, before you start, how about we just define time? <laughs> I was cracking up watching these old people uh, try and tackle Bitcoin. Um, it was really funny. Um, so if we revisit this, so in the same way that corn farmers are inherently long corn, so to pull their hedge, they short corn futures. Bitcoin miners are inherently short difficulty, so they would be the long side of the difficulty derivatives market. 
So who's ready to short difficulty, that black line that never stopped going up? <laughs> no, nobody. <laughs> it's a bad trade. It's a really bad trade, right? Look at that thing. That is a monster. Hardware is constantly innovating. Demand for Bitcoin and interest in Bitcoin is constantly going up. That's a tough trade to be short that thing. Um, but actually, that's what market makers get paid for, <laughs> right? They find the price of this future. Um, they buffer in their market, and they go, this is a risk transfer. So miners are transferring risk to a market maker, and then the risk still exists, and it's the market maker's job to then dissolve of that risk, find other hedges within the market to make it poof and disappear, capture a spread, and then that's how Citadel makes a kajillion dollars. Yeah. Um, so I've actually been talking to the Citadels, I've spoken to Susquehanna, I've spoken to the SIBO, some serious market participants, and they're like, get out of town, man. Like, there's real flow in Bitcoin. And they call it a shark pool, as no one wants to trade on Coinbase because I'm trading against the other sharks. We need flow. We need someone whose economics live outside speculation. And so now my phone's constantly ringing, like, yo, my man, do you have any more of that mining risk? Like, let me itch at that. I want to make markets there. Um, and I think as this market matures and we start bringing in more complex market participants, just the general market is going to become more efficient, right? How do you even price Bitcoin? There's no credit market. Like, miners are the most authentic, organic participant that we have in this asset class. How much did it take to produce that thing and what was your risk profile on producing it? And we'll have much more efficient pricing, um, we'll incentivize much more people to deploy hash rate onto the network. It will be a, a real net positive. Derivatives have like a, a, a bad name because of 2008. But uh, from a risk transfer standpoint, they're really effective and they need to exist in, uh, in Bitcoin. So we'll actually be executing our first OTC structured notes with miners. I was with uh, some miners at lunch today. We're all really fucking excited. That's pretty cool. Um, so that's great. And uh, yeah, I got a minute left. So thank you. Um, I'm on Twitter. This is my email. I do do the lightning stuff pretty much my whole life. But secretly, I like markets. And I'm trying to figure it out. Um, so this is going to take a, a cumulative effort for all of us to solve and create this new derivatives market. So um, if anyone wants to be involved, ask questions, um, I'm all ears. I'm all ears. Peer review, all the things. So thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah.